Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for making the trip out on this uh, on this lovely spring day here. It feels like it's like finally the first day of spring, <laughs> more or less. Um, I, mean, I don't want to jinx us here, but uh, we have a I think an exciting agenda this evening. Um, really, it, it's uh, it's meant as as a uh, as a meeting to help decide BCSQI's future directions, and you guys as the VCSQI, I would say, the most committed members are are here to uh, to offer your opinions and guidance. And um, really, the mission of VCSQI is to further your mission. So you have to let us know what's important to you all and how we can continue to help you down your path and help you improve your practices. So um, our quality committee will look at some data, mostly on the surgical side. Um, we have some some. Uh, FAQs. We have a nephrologist from University of Virginia who's going to come in and answer some questions about uh, NephroCheck as well as um, UVA's uh, <coughs> new ERAS program. Uh, there was also, I think, some FAQs on um, coding of, of pre-op uh, dialysis that we'll, we'll drill into. Um, and we'll introduce you to, uh, to our new VCSQI colleague, Sherry. Uh, we'll be working with you all uh, closely going forward. And then the evening session is going to be more of a of an interactive, uh, hands-on workshop. Um, the the goal is to to come together, put our put our brains together, and understand what the VCSQI mission and vision are, and then how we can best target some some goals and initiatives to work toward um, that mission and vision. And we have some uh, some collaborative activities designed to. Uh, to get your feedback, and uh, it'll be fun too. We'll get we'll get moving around, and if you guys have time too. It's a, a beautiful day out there, so maybe take a walk around the lake uh, before dinner, or stretch your legs and get some fresh air too. It's it's, it's a beautiful uh, beautiful time of year here in Virginia. So, without further ado, we'll, we'll dive in to some data. Um, as always, feel free to to stop with any questions or or comments of me or or of your colleagues and peers. Um, but these are all STS uh, measures. Yeah, I don't know if it's just my ears, but I'm having trouble hearing. Having trouble hearing? I can, I can uh, pick up the mic here too, sorry. So our first chart here just shows the VCSQI overall volume by year and, uh, and STS procedure type categorization. They show an overall downward trend in our cardiac surgery volume in, at the top here. Um, and the cabbage volume, I think, has, has dropped commensurately. Um, however, the valves and the other procedures have, have remained more or less uh, steady, you know, with some fluctuations year by year. Um, I didn't plot the cath PCI volume by year. We don't have, I would say, as good of participation on that level. But I think we would see a pretty similar upward trend in the, in the cardiology procedures if we map those against one another. Just to give you kind of a a global view of our procedure volume. but still about five to 6,000 a year, uh, open hearts here in Virginia. First set of metrics, we were looking at some, some of our standard STS outcomes metrics. So our first chart is new onset of atrial fib uh, by hospital. Those of you who have been to our meetings here before, you'll be familiar with the style of the chart. We, for each hospital show two different time periods. In yellow is 2016 and 2017 combined, sort of a two year uh, baseline. And then in blue is our 2018, the most recent uh, calendar year of STS data. So it'll allow you to do just sort of a quick snapshot as your institution getting better or getting worse, uh, just based on those three years worth of data. Um, we've sorted the hospitals, which are coded down on the bottom. We've sorted them in increasing order so our lowest AFib rates in 2018 are over on the left. The highest are over on the right side of the screen. And then those are plotted against the VCSQI benchmark in green and the STS national benchmark in red, um, which at VCSQI is just a hair lower here for, uh, for AFib. So that's kind of the, the overall legend and the style of the charts here. This goes to show the, the top centers in VCSQI are, are at around a 10% a fib rate. Um, on the other side of the chart, there's there's three or four that are slightly above 
the STS national average. Um, we we've see a lot of top performers here, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good data, as well as uh, you know some variation too among programs. Now to go ahead and try to put up the 90th percentile that you've been working on, or at least. Yes. Um, so going going forward, Chris, yeah, I'll, I'll just repeat it. If others, if the other end didn't hear you. We will show this to get plotted against the the three state 90th percentile, which was an item I was going to cover later on. But there are two other state collaboratives that are willing to share some data with us up in uh, Michigan and Washington. So we've designed a a. a mechanism to share results by hospital and then plot the uh, the 90th percentile sort of as a not just as a state or a national benchmark but as a high hurdle so what are the top programs at these three states uh, doing so Chris yes hopefully the next next meeting we will have this benchmark other questions comments on uh, the AFIP slide This one is not risk adjusted, so I think that's just something to take in mind. A few of the charts going forward are um, observed to expected ratios. Before we get there, though, this is the latest look at our readmission rates by hospital. It's the same sort of style where we have our uh, two-year baseline and, and one year, um, one year of most recent data for each program. This is 30-day readmission as uh, from discharge. Based on the STS data, this might be a little different than how CMS is, is looking at you since they have a, a different data source they've matched that against. Um, you all may or may not have had some experiences with that. Um, but readmission has, has been a focus of VCSQI for a number of years here. And you will see we are doing just a, just a hair better than the STS uh, national benchmark. Questions or comments? Any experiences to relate from maybe some of our programs who are down here closer to the five or six percent readmission rate? Is there any way to tell what are the small facilities and what are the large facilities? Th these are these ones are kind of mixed together since we didn't do the transparent um, data this time around. Just off the top of my head. I believe on the left-hand side are, are a few of the smaller centers. GPS signal lost. Are you here? 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 No worries. Great, great reduction in readmission. Is there a story there that can be told? I mean, like, there's. It seems to me that there was some learning going on there that I'd be. So it's, it's a good question, Peggy. Um, do we have any volunteers from one of the centers who who improved? You don't have to say who you are, but experiences or advice to relate. Mike, I think you guys improved a little bit there, and I caught you with a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just had one contact in. So oh. You changed our numbers, didn't you? Change your numbers? Well, our numbers different. No, your code is the same. It's okay. We we, we can come back to you. Mike says he's not doing anything differently. Is this one that you think would be more of a random, there's a random effect here to a certain I, degree? I think it's random because last year we did, I mean, last year our readmission rate went up, but it was because of things that were totally non-relative to their um, admission. 
and it was just bad luck in the month of January with the horrible frost. And then 2018, we kind of rebounded. So. Fair enough, thank you. Next set, I think we go into, well, first before we get to risk adjusted data, we have a couple of transfusion level charts. First one shows, um, it's, it's actually a, a combined um, intra-op blood and intra-op red blood cell. So intra-op blood is in yellow on this one, red blood cells is in blue. I'm just going to show again how VCSQI programs almost entirely are transfusing below the uh, the STS threshold. Somewhere down nearly, you know, between two and three percent or, or lower here. It's pretty phenomenal. See similar trends, although a little bit higher proportions in terms of post-op blood usage. And the, the VCSQI <laughs> state rate here would be pretty significantly below the, uh, the STS benchmark. And feel free to stop me here, but I, there's a lot of data to run through, so I'm gonna keep going. Now these are some of the risk adjusted charts. First one shows stroke observed to expected. So against an STS norm of 1.0, um, you know, if you're less than one, you're, you're performing better than the risk model expects. If you're above one, you're performing worse than the risk model. On this one, um, VCSQI is a little bit lower than STS. There are a few blips on the uh, on the extreme right end of the chart here. Approximately the same with renal failure, although VCSQI is slightly above the STS on this chart. Stroke and renal failure have a relatively low N, so a few cases can really, can really um, show an uptick in rates. What's the definition of that? I believe it, there's a what three X creatinine rise. Three times the three X or new requirement for dialysis. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't know I had. No, you're fine. External wound. Uh, this one again is is one where a number of the programs have zero incidents, um, even over the course of, of two or three years. But then the ones who do have them, um, a few cases again will will make your rate look pretty large here. And reoperation. Um, again, a lot of a lot of variation between programs. We go from zero reops to a, an OE of about two here. But overall, again, BCSQI is performing pretty well compared against the national average. Next couple ones are uh, ventilator related charts. Our first is prolonged ventilation OE, so vent time greater than 24 hours. Um, VCSQI again performs a little bit better than the national average. And it seems like it has more variation among programs, though. Steady rise across the board here. Can you set these slides out? Yeah, I shall. And last of our standard. Uh, outcomes and process measures is early extubation, so proportion of cases extubated in less than six hours. 
This one, VCSQI, has continually done better than the STS average. Almost all of our programs are, are beating that national rate here. Our next set of charts was, was based on some discussion questions from our quality committee call uh, a couple months prior. We started to look at renal failure against uh, transfusion rates as well as uh, cardiopulmonary bypass times. So our first chart just shows for the entire state what, um, based on how long a patient was on the CPB machine, what were their renal failure rates. So with a statewide average of about 2% renal failure. Um, you can see shorter, uh, shorter pump time. Their renal failure rate is, is almost halved. I'm not sure if that's a, a correlation or causality effect there, but it was an interesting little nugget. I guess the shorter cases are just, are just easier and they have less complications. We, we did not look at off-pump cases here, no. That would be a subsequent metric we can pull, though, what's renal failure for off-pump? This is an isolated cabbage, yeah. We didn't really standardize it based on number of graphs or or any piece like that. I think this is just looking at all all the on-pump ISO cabs. We, we broke these down by hospital as well, um, looking at mean pump time on top versus observed renal failure rate on bottom. It seemed more or less more or less random in terms of the average pump times. So it's not like if you had an average pump time that was really low, you necessarily had a, uh, a low renal failure rate. This is just looking at a, at a broad level. Next, we, we sliced it by transfusion group. So based on patients who received certain types of blood, in this case, uh, either intra-op red blood cells, post-op red blood cells, neither or both. You can see as you move from left to right, um, they're getting more blood and their corresponding renal failure rate rises. So if you don't get any blood, your, your chances of renal failure is about half a percent. Uh, but if you get both intra-op and post-op uh, pack cells, then your renal failure rate is over eight. It's about a 16-fold rise. And we, um, at Judy's request, we, in this instance, excluded patients with operative mortality or with major complications outside of renal failure. So we excluded the re-ops, we excluded strokes. We just looked at patients who only had renal failure as their main complication. Um, and then we stratified it by transfusion group. We saw still um, about a 1% renal failure rate statewide, but less than half of that if you got no blood. And we ran these by hospital as well. So on the top here is by hospital renal failure rates for the set of patients who had no RBCs, the bottom is if you had intra-op RBCs only. And you'll see the rates start to jump on our next set of charts here. If you had post-op or intra and post-op, renal failure rates at some institutions were 20 or 30 percent. It's a small set of cases perhaps, but. Like autolog autologous transfusions, or what do you mean, Tracy? No, uh, 
they come in and they've got um, you know hematocrits of like seven or eight doing them beforehand or you just transfuse them in the OR And our last set of charts focuses specifically on surgical site infections. So first we are looking at any surgical site infection, deep or superficial, by center. Um, this again is looking at the sort of the three year view of data. Um, a fair amount of, of variation here. Some centers have, have made a big improvement over the last couple of years. Others have remained low, although nobody had no infections over the course of, of three years. I just feel like by looking at all this graph, there's not only between among hospital variation, there's year to year variation too. Like, it's hard, I mean, from, sorry, from one year, the one hospital significantly improved and another hospital significantly worsened. I mean, is there any way we can calculate uh, like a p-value or something just to just to show that this is not a result of randomness or just or uh, I mean surgical side infection is probably low volume for everybody right. it's a good point dr. Tang um, my response to that would be yes when you're when you're looking at individual level hospital data over the course of just two or three years, the volumes will be pretty small uh, in a lot of cases. We, we could put in error bars or something like that that would show, you know, hey, is this a, is this a wide range or is this pretty, is this pretty tight? Um, or we could show over, over the course of a you know, longer span of time. Um, the disadvantage to that is it's not going to be as recent of data. So if you're comparing yourself to where you were five years ago, is that you know, a relevant comparison or not? Um, but I think there are some, there, there is a, a grain of salt here, I guess, in interpreting the data. If you dropped from six to one, it's not necessarily that, you know, you made a, a sweeping change. It could just be, you write a random effect. But I'm open to, uh, to suggestions for how we can present the data in a, in a more meaningful way here as well. Next, we honed, honed in on specifically the superficial sternal wound infections. Again, these are less than 1% statewide, so you're right, this is a pretty, pretty rare event in general. opened a little bit of the sternum and put some stuff in there. You were able to see that and now we can code that. I think our coding is getting better. We have care everywhere. You can see if he had something similar done somewhere else. I just think we're better at identifying it with this, the, the sternal wound infections because we have to for 30 days. I think that might be a little bit of the difference. So not just practice but coding as well. And our last view here, I believe, is just another look at deep sternal wound by program. Uh, this, I guess, specifically is where you would see some of some of the effects of the coding, Tracy. Well, these you should. I mean, these are people that are having some significant procedures done at their hospital. That should not be different. The, the small things that are done in the doctor's offices are what we I've been coding more of going into the, the office notes more and checking there, but these are, this is significant. This is, you're gonna see that 
regardless. That's a, that's a, a hospital admission, all of those. It's kind of interesting that there's a significant increase in 2018 in hospitals that might not have had too many before. And we were kind of talking about this on our quality call, but I don't know what it is, but I know we saw a significant increase this year. And we've had a couple that we haven't had for years. Yeah. So I don't know, I don't know, but it looks like there's... It's a gift. Was it, was it just us? We had, um, when we built our hybrid room, we actually uh, had a, an increase in just, we had an increase in superficial site and uh, mediastinitis the year we built our hybrid room. And it, you could see a trend every time we, uh, the cath lab was right next to our OR, and when we would shut the air handlers down at night to do work and then turn them back on, we would see our rate go like this. They did all the right things, but we just saw that. And Dr. Cardone, when we would have our monthly quality meeting, we discussed it, and Dr. Cardone had brought up that when he was in Pennsylvania and they built their hybrid room, it was adjacent to their OR, and they had the same experience. So after that happened, everything kind of, after we opened the room up, everything just leveled out, and we had no other events. So I don't know if anybody's doing any construction. Hybrid room for years. Yeah. We were doing construction and they were okay. our our cath lab and OR really sit side by side and when they shut the air hand, hand, handling system down at night to do duct work um, through the trunk lines and then they fired up the next morning we just saw a trend of superficial wound and then we had one knees tinnitus that year and we hadn't had any and it was during that time period Uh, maybe it's something we need to, to keep our eye on if it looks like this is trending upward. Um, Linda, I'll see if, if it's, you know, if it's gone up across the statewide level as well. So that was, was a, sort of an overview of data, but by all means, it's not meant to, not meant to be the only data we see. So if you have any other ideas or suggestions, um, let me know and I, I can, I can slice and dice it and, um, you know, update it with the latest uh, information and as well. Yeah. When do you think it will start to show, and we, Beth and I were riding around this place for about a half hour, so uh, maybe you did it already, but when, I know like our, our colleagues from the cardiology side have been coming, when, is there plans to to incorporate that data? And yes, it out? We, will, we will see the some of the cardiology data tonight. So we're, we're getting there. And um, a couple other topics to keep in mind are, uh, yeah, our uh, transparency, if, if there's, you know, interest in, in unblinding the data um, more so, which we've done in the past for, for certain metrics. Um, and um, just how, you know, how we want to use this data as a group too. Because I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential here. But. Well, I think there is. I mean, I, I, I think that with cardiology doing this group, the hope would be that we would be starting to discuss collaborative efforts between those two disciplines to move things like renal failure, um, which I think last year, um, you know, we recognized that was something that was across all programs that was just a rise in renal failure across the board. And that seems like a really a genuine opportunity for us to collaborate with them. Here. Definitely, and we'll we'll drill into some of the the data from Cath PCI um, this evening. So I just wanted to give a preview of some of the other resources we have in development right now in process. Um, the first is something that I hope to have online by today, but was not able to have up. This is just a snapshot from my local uh, machine here shows, I think, similar to, to a report library some of you had seen in past years um, that we would put on vcsqi.org. 
you would log in via a username and password and, and be able to see some of these same metrics, um, both at the state level and by hospital. We don't have to run through the data again, but our measures are here on the right, the time frames on the left, and you kind of click through to, to see the, the different views uh, for each metric and time period. Um, I will let you know when this is online. It, it, it should be coming in the, in the week, next few weeks here, I hope. Um, my T issues. Um, so that's one item. Another one is an online forum that myself and a colleague up at Hopkins have put together uh, for database managers to, to kind of act as a resource library and uh, an online community to ask and, and record questions that database managers have of one another. So this is called DaVinci's Forum. Um, I can send out the U URL later, but it's on a site called mdgrandrounds.com. If you go there, you'll see it. And we have database manager forums for a number of the different registries, right now adult cardiac, and the other two STS, thoracic and congenital, as well as some generic resources and other, other uh, boards on here. So um, give that a look, and um, let me know if you think it's useful or not. But we'll start, uh, we'll start sharing that out. The last piece is Horror Database Managers. The, uh, the Michigan Quality Checker has been updated for version 2.9. So you can access that on their website, mstcvs.org slash resources. And it's about halfway down the page here. You download it. I think it only works on Windows. But if you have a Windows machine, you can download it and just kind of run your, run your harvest file through it. And it'll tell you the, the data quality checks on it. Um, everything runs locally, so you're not uploading anything anywhere. It's just all on your own machine, and it'll it'll give you some uh, some advice and you know uh, throw back a list of records where some potential inconsistencies or missing values show up, um, kind of as a complementary tool to the STS data quality reports that are out there. Three other short pieces. We already discussed the three state reports, which are a work in progress with uh, Washington and uh, Michigan right now. The, the long-term follow-up data, we're also still in the process of obtaining uh, authorization for that piece. So we're hopeful we can have a, a data source which we can A, research on and track our patients longitudinally. So we're, we have a process for uploading record IDs and then checking whether or not the patient uh, is deceased or not. Uh, and secondly, as a tool for our database managers to, to check um, their, their records you know, prior to STS harvest. And if you're having trouble finding them or contacting them as a way to see if they're uh, alive or not based on this national database. So that's another tool we have in development. Um, lastly is our STAR uh, matrix and potentially putting a VCS code benchmark in, I think, um, you can ask Jula about that in more detail, but uh, hey, Jula, and <laughs> um, I think it's it's also a work in progress, though, to to eff effectively have a sort of a little reference line on the Armus uh, hybrid reporting system somewhere for not just for STS but also for VCSQI. And so with with that, I think that kind of concludes the the data review and resources. Uh, portion of the quality meeting. Uh, next, I, I would like to introduce my, my colleague and friend. Um, she's our, our newest VCSQI staff member here, and really excited to have her on board. Her, her role is, is really to work with our VCSQI programs one-on-one -on -one and to help, uh, help collaborate on and implement different quality improvement projects. Um, Sherry can, can tell you a little bit more about the program, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now, Sherry. Thanks for being here today. Everyone, I'll apologize in advance. I have a bit of a migraine. So if I look at you and I'm winking, you know, I'm not flirting. Um, <laughs> but thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, so just to first, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. I am located, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, which is probably why I have a migraine. It's cold and snowy out there and it's nice and beautiful here. Um, 
been there. I have uh, over 20 years experience in working with uh, ma working in major healthcare organizations in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, those range from working in anesthesia for pre-op clearance, um, developing mechanisms for physicians and surgeons to know if their patients are cleared, and this was prior to the EMR implementation. Um, worked with in pulmonary um, prior to there even being known as a multidisciplinary team. I established one to in increase the service line. Um, has a, have extensive experience with physician leadership and development um, at the Cleveland Clinic, and my last most recent job was in hematology and oncology support services where I manage quality medical records and several other service lines. So I'm here today. Uh, okay, so I have my master's in science in positive organizational development, development and change from Case Western Reserve University. I'm certified as a green belt in Six Sigma. Um, I want to stay there. I like working with teams. I don't like the high level stuff. I like getting into the nitty, nitty gritty. So I don't want to go any further than green belt. I love, I love, I love it from that perspective. That's where all the magic happens. Um, I do, I am certified in emotional intelligence and I have training in team and individual learning styles. I've joined VCSQI in May 2018. Yeah. Um, through the SAN 2.0 program. And just to tell you a little bit more about that program, um, it was a grant funded opportunity through CMS where we work with healthcare organizations, private practices all across the country to help them transition or transform their care from a more cost based to a more quality based environment. And these are just some of our, our goals or things that we accomplished. We work with more than 600 clinicians um, at about 120 different programs across the country, different specialties. The overall goal was to position the practices, and I keep referring to practices as either the specialty is primary care or cardiology, cardio, cardiothoracic surgery, um, to position them to join an APM, alternative payment model, and or improve their scores with MIPS. Um, some of the targets that we worked on was patient-centered collaboration, helping them to analyze their data more to make change, implement a couple of strategies to improve their processes, um, incorporated teamwork, and also focusing on cost reduction. Throughout that program, we help practices to improve processes or measures um, that impacted over 11,000 patients, um, including avoiding 34 hospitalizations and 101 blood transfusions that were saved resulting in $1.6 million in total cost savings. So after this program, working with VCSQI, we know that there's an opportunity here to do more. So let's take some of those learnings that we have from the TCPI program and bring it here into the VCSQI 1.0 <laughs> and just make some magic happen. So what does this mean? Um, this has helped us to develop the new program, which is why I'm here. Um, we're calling it the v VCSQI QI program. And the overall aim of the program is to improve quality care and improve health outcomes and reduce cost of care. So my role, I'm an advisor, I'm a coach. So if you think of me as a team coach, <laughs> what does that mean? Um, when you think of sports, most people think of sports or any game as the different teams, but reality is, it's what is going to make a great game. What is going to be something phenomenal that happens in that game that will cause for people to want more, for people to think that that game or that series or that playoffs was one for the books. So that's the overall goal, the mutual desired outcome. As a coach, my job would be to work with each individual or each facility individually to learn about your compl complexities. And I've met with a couple, whew, hats off to you. Uh, <laughs> to understand your different complexities in your organization, your strengths, and where the opportunities for improvement exist. Um, I will work with you to coordinate plays. You know? So I'll learn more about your um, individual facilities 
know where there's some improvement opportunities are. And because I'm working with other facilities, I know who's doing something better, who can probably help you in your trans transition. Um, I would love use those or these different relationships that are reforged to help leverage your strength in, in each individual facility. Uh, so that's, that's this slide. So as we get to work with each other, every once in a while I'll say something poetic. So here's my first round. <laughs> so if you think of this program as something um, like artwork, here's our masterpiece. When you're working in healthcare, I think we all have the experience of you know where you want to be, but how do you get there? And in order to make that type of transition or transformation happen, you have to honestly pay attention to every element that goes into creating that masterpiece and make sure it's standalone is more quality. So if you're looking at this specific piece of art, this is the only one I can find online. Uh, <laughs> You think about the brushes. We don't want any brush to help us design this masterpiece. We want to make sure that the brush itself is capable of making sure that we can produce something phenomenal in the, in the long run. Um, maybe we want to, you know, use it a couple of times before we use it to apply that specific masterpiece. We also would need paint. Of course, you can't build any artwork without paint, right? So we want to make sure we select that paint, prime it, whatever we need to do to add it to create something beautiful in the end. We need a canvas. Okay, we have our brushes, we have our paint, but if we don't have anything to paint on that foundation, what we're doing is useless. We need inspiration. You cannot create a masterpiece if you're not inspired to do so. You all are here, so the inspiration is there. We need a muse. Ah, what are we going to paint? Well, we know we want to um, reduce these uh, hospital readmissions. <laughs> so that's our muse. This is what we're going to focus on, for example. And we also need motivation. You know, inspiration and motivation are two different things. You may be inspired to do something, but if you don't have that team behind you pushing you and encouraging you to make a change, it's not going to happen. So together, with all those ideas and utensils put together, we're gonna to create a masterpiece. And this is what you're all here, and this is part of what my role will help facilitate. So, thinking more so of the concept of art, this is VCSQI's muse. <laughs> this is the brush, this is the paint, uh, this is everything that it would take to put together um, that artwork. Um, for community agencies. You know, we're gonna work with communities. We need to, you know, figure out what those communities are and establish that relationship to forge that collaboration. Um, another example. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Coordinate care. All right, there's a lot of different aspects in healthcare that need to work together in order to provide quality care. So again, this is our brush, this is our paint. We know what the canvas is, all these different me metrics that we're already tracking through through BCSQI, which is our data. We have all the tools that we need to do something phenomenal. Now let's do something about it. So, the proposed program um, for my role uh, is kind of a six step process, but since um, the, the rollout of this, I've been here in about, you know, roughly two weeks. <laughs> I've met with five different sites over the phone. Um, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity here, but, but where are we going to take this? <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. You guys do phenomenal work, and I can't wait to start working more so with you. Um, so the first step would be, you know, have a 30, 45 minute phone call. And at that phone call, let's focus on, based on the data that we may have, which measure you want to focus more or transform or improve on. Um, from there, step two would be to complete a baseline assessment. So based on that measure that you select, let's do a quick analysis of where you are now so we can plan or plot out what it would take to transform. Step three, 
you know, we'll meet. I'll show you what the practice plan is or your transformation plan is. And then we'll determine how frequently you want to have these phone calls with me via Zoom. How often you want me to come out to visit your site in order to help you transform. Step four, continue to have those biweekly phone calls or site visits. Develop strategies to help you transform. And as I'm meeting with you, I'm going to, you know, I don't know how I do it. I just love doing it. But I'm able to see where you're strong. And I would love to share those strengths with other members of VCSQI so we all can be strong together. Um, and that's where step five comes in. Step, step six is to continue to build on this quality initiative that we have and sustain the changes that you make in your organization. So this is the program goals. Um, the Mona Lisa here is the greatest work of art in history, but we're going to create something better, okay? <laughs> the output, you know, um, what the board charged me with is to engage um, our current members to create something phenomenal. Um, identify the gaps and implement quality projects to help you, you know, close that gap to make something great. Um, a couple of things that I would love to get out of here or, or to collaborate with you to make would be a patient um, or clinic staff engagement group. You know, let's work on making sure that your employees are happy in their roles. Let's make sure your patients are excited about coming and, and taking that information or the, the feedback that we may conduct in different facilities to see who has better patient satisfaction or employee satisfaction rates. And let's see how we can merge it together so we are all performing at the same level, if you will. And of course, you see the outcomes, foster quality improvement in cardiac, um, cardiology and cardiac surgery environments. Of course, want to save costs. CMS is on us. <laughs> and uh, promote collaboration between providers, in enhance communication. Um, so this is what we all you know, can do together. So my last slide, I will leave you with some food for thought. What can we make based on what your relationship, your membership you have currently with VCSQI? What kind of art can we come up with? What will be that masterpiece? Ooh, sorry. What will be that masterpiece that we create that will have other organizations say, "Hey, I want to be a part of that. I want." You know, I want a piece of that. What does VCSQI members have? And how can I be a part of it? How can I contribute? So i leave you with that question. What can we do together? Anyone want to answer that? <laughs> Any questions or concerns you may have? Sherry? Yes. When you've met with teams, have you met with any cardiology groups yet? Or has it all been uh, We have not met with any cardiology groups yet, but I'm very interested and meeting with cardiology groups, and I think that is probably the driving force since your new members are you part of a cardiology group. If I can come visit you, I would love to. You can come anytime. All right. <laughs> Any other questions or concerns? Okay, what the, how does it sound to you? Good. All right. Good presentation, huh? even though I have this migraine. All right. <laughs> okay, so next we have, well, we're going to skip through here since Dr. Bowman is not here yet. You heading out, or you want to sing? I'm going to head out, but again, um, welcome on board, Sherry. Sherry's going to facilitate the discussion for the for the rest of our hour here in the quality community. We'll break at five for dinner, and um, just uh, feel free to share your, your questions or comments. Dr. Bowman from UVA, hopefully, will show up here pretty soon. But um, other than that, we will uh, we'll just kind of run through our our slides. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you. Okay, we'll skip through some of the things that Dr. Bowman can probably answer. Um, Dr. Bowman should be here about 4.15. Went too far ahead. Does it, you, do you need a potty break or anything? You're okay. You're okay.
Okay, so let's talk about the STS frequently asked questions. Um, <coughs> one of the members here provided an OSA uh, oops, like, diagnostic tool um, and had a couple of questions. Judy, are you here? Nope, Judy's not here. Okay, we'll skip this till Judy gets here. <laughs> no, she's not, not, oh, she's not coming. Here. Did you want to, you, do you know anything about the information she provided and wanted to give an overview? Um, she had said uh, they started using a nurse-given uh, a nurse given um, questionnaire on sleep apnea and it counted as an evaluation and you could code sleep apnea if their numbers proved to be a certain number, you know, whatever, four or five. Yeah. And uh, she checked with the STS and she said that was fine. And uh, Judy said that um, if you could code sleep apnea, it adds 1% to your mortality uh, and 3% to your morbidity uh, risk scores. So um, Eddie sent that out, I think after the last phone meeting, and um, I haven't brought it to my physicians, but I certainly am, because anything that increases the risk uh, percentage will help us, so. Have you brought it to your guys yet? Actually, okay. we talked about it we talked about it in our quality committee meeting yesterday, which in, is multidisciplinary with surgeons and our MPs who do the pre-op workup. And it sounds like a good thing to do, but what the clinicians said was, okay, so you diagnose sleep apnea. What are we going to do with those patients? Are we going to send them for a sleep study pre-op? Um, are we going to treat them differently post-op? What are we going to do? So we have to have a plan. We can't just code it and not treat the patient. That's what I ran into, too, when I mentioned it to our surgeon. And he said, so with, if we're getting our pulmonary group follows the patients in the intensive care as intensivists, thank you, sorry. And he said, does that turn into that console automatically? Are they going to follow them afterwards? Do I have them, should they get the consult ahead of time and then we diagnose it now so that I'm not responsible for the follow-up and the treatment of because I'm discovering it if it's not already in there. And it, and it turned into this, what I thought was going to be this brief, hey, in our quality session tomorrow, do you want to talk about this? Um, you know, what's well, tomorrow, but I said next Friday. And he said, <clears throat> Well, there's a lot to that. Let's talk about that. And he went down this mirage, and I thought I was hoping that would be better vetted in this meeting to see what all of you had run into as well, because I didn't have a quick answer for him. She said, she made it sound like the nurses did it, the number was there, and that's all they did. That's the way it sounded. I don't read it. What's that? What's that? What's that? When I was talking to Judy, she was telling me that it's more or less identifying the risk. It's not necessarily diagnosing. But the definition is a diagnosis, so that's why the I. The tool is to diagnose it. But the, so we use stop bang. Yeah, which, that's, that's yeah. So in definition of that tool is a risk identification. It's not a tool to diagnose. Because obviously to diagnose sleep apnea, you have to have a formal sleep study. So, but the STS told her that was fine. I know, I know, and that's that's I, I was discussing with her, you know, my struggles on coding that. But, you know, if you think about it, it this whole definition is to identify the risk, the preoperative well, risk. And, you know, we've all had patients that, <clears throat> you know, didn't have a formal diagnosis before, and then they get in the CS and they're snoring their heads off and everything, and they're going, oh, my God, I guess it's terrible. So, you know, if, I don't, I don't know, if, but it says capture patients with prescribed home therapy. Just well, because you're giving them a score, they're not on home therapy. Yeah, we, we already, we already, I mean, you are, I think I mean, this is part of that I, definition. Yeah, but I think this is to catch uh, patients without a previous yes. formal diagnosis. Yes. Um, and, and just because we code them on, and, and I understand with the physicians, oh, I, I talk really loud. Don't be too loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, <laughs> And I understand the physician's concern, but if if the they fill out the questionnaire and the questionnaire is I guess somehow entered into the patient record right. by, by a scan or if they have a template or whatever, 
and we code yes for sleep <coughs> apnea, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's adding to their patient profile the diagnosis of sleep apnea. But see, it's our a practitioners would be putting that in the H and P. Yeah. yeah, it carries with well, it, it some carries it carries with consequences it. with it. it I would does. think if you're going to be audited, then it would have to be in there, would it not? Yes. 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 So if you if it is, then it's in their H and P, then that kind of makes us liable, doesn't it? Well, to, to proceed to a sleep study, study, if you have a sleep study lab that can exactly. fit them in immediately so on that no, admission, we, we or do you send them home with CPAP? What do you do? Our, our, what pulmonologists, our pulmonologists are medic intensivists, and they've been very clear about it. They, they cannot send somebody home without with a uh, sleep apnea device without having done the study. Correct. Right. So, so that's yeah. the quandary. This is the quandary. We right, I know. So, so I. I Seems to me like it's a liability issue. We have a comment over here. Yeah, so hi guys. Um, so I checked quickly about the impact of uh, sleep apnea on the risk scores since we developed the risk scores and many other things. So it's a complex algorithm. It's very difficult to isolate one single thing which influence something. Mainly because so many other things has to happen before in order to make that change. But on the top of that, the only positive impact of sleep apnea happens when you calculate morbidity or mortality. There's no increase of morbidity, mortality rate, and actually some of the feeds like uh, prolonged ventilation and things like that, let me just verify that again. It's stroke, pro, uh, prolonged ventilation, yeah, is increased more than uh, Predictor, uh, the predicted morbidity or mortality, which is interesting because prone ventilation is all part of that group. So, and two other cases that the, the actual variable is negatively affecting that particular score, so like stroke. So, when somebody tells you that that increased the mortality prediction by 1% and 3%, it's probably in one or two cases where they recognize that. I don't think it can be generalized. And uh, as a matter of fact, some cases are negatively affecting. I'm not saying this is right, but that's what the, the algorithms which STS came out with uh, telling me right now. So, In those patients who've been screened, you have if you check, positive for sleep apnea, yeah, it yeah. would potentially increase their Increase the prolonged ventilation prediction and morbidity or mortality, decrease the the uh, stroke value and uh, six days mortality, obviously. I mean, a short list, uh, risk of short days of, of uh, length of stays. Yeah, so that's obviously negatively infecting that. But morbid mortality, there's no effect on mortality. There's no coefficient which change that score. By the way, that's the reason we had to modify the uh, online risk calculator because there's so many times the actual variable seemingly doesn't affect the score until you go down a little bit further and that clicks in. And um, so it's, it's a, it was a very challenging algorithm to develop in the first place. And the result is not 100% you know, clear and black and white to the users and the physicians. So I just want to make sure that you know that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone want to add anything <coughs> further onto this specific tool or slide? Yeah, this is the tool. I'm sorry, I should have advanced earlier. But this is the actual tool. And if you did not, we're, we're going to send out these slides if you didn't receive it already, um, the tool. But this is the breakdown of the tool as well. So she labeled it. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions or concerns regarding this? I should, I'm texting you. Guys. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> we, you know, you can just call her. I can come back to the phone. <laughs> um, she, said, she said that we should at least overnight oximetry people who get a score of five or above just to trigger them on the, as an outpatient if you can't before surgery. Makes sense. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Can you repeat that? She just says that um, we should try to at least get an oximetry on people who score a five um, or above, but three is a trigger for an outpatient OSA. Of course, you know, we can discuss this further in our quality meetings. Okay, so we have a frequently asked question. Um, the nurses are use OSA diagnosis assessment for sleep apnea on an admission. It's called OSA diagnostic, diagnosis. Um, we complete only if a patient has had a formal sleep study. If a patient scores as being a risk for sleep apnea on this score, can we say yes to sleep apnea? Got this a little already. Definition says yes. See, so yeah, I see where you say it's you know iffy on whether it's actually being diagnosed or just being to show at risk screened. screened. You know, it's just you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to have to talk more about this. Get Judy. I like to see that the data says between the patients that are identified at risk with prolonged ventilation and our patients. I wonder if that correlates. Hmm. Um, so the next question we have, does your program adhere to ACC and AHA post cabbage? Recommendations for a statin therapy. And that was from Mike Brown and Mary Washington. We actually discussed it on the quality call. Yeah. So okay. Okay. Which was helpful. Thank yeah. you, guys. Okay, excellent. Any additional feedback questions? You good? No, I appreciate everybody's feedback. I will admit, the charts I've uh, abstracted since that call, I've noticed that in two high terms. <laughs> because before I'm like, oh, they're on a step. That's all I cared about. But now I'm and seeing a uh, high dose step. Do you do you, uh, do you do the amiodarone protocol? Modified. Modified. We do. We try to put them on, but uh, you know, sometimes it's only a day or two of PO mm -hmm. beforehand. Okay. And did we answer the second part of the question on the call? If not, what regimen of statin therapy are you using? We did. We did. Yeah. yeah. So here's another question regarding the readmission definition. Um, this was, I don't know who this was posed by, but I was told by hospital coding consultants that the definition of whether a readmission is billed as an inpatient versus OBS or ED um, is not really a medical decision, but instead decided by utilization review and the insurance company. A doctor might order admit as inpatient, but that doesn't mean that that is how how case will ultimately be billed. Um, when patients is readmitted to one of our hospitals, I can see if a patient I can see medical record department coder um, coded it as inpatient versus OBS or ED. Um, I use that to determine whether or not I will key readmission field yes or no. Do you agree with this? Yes. 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 Okay. And Does I've been on. Anybody not agree with that? This is probably the first time I, everybody agreed. <laughs> well, I think we discussed it when this okay. first became a problem because, you know, we were thinking anything over 24 hours was an admission, but they weren't coded that way. So I think this is the way we ultimately all decided what we wanted to do with it. There's another part to this question. Um, I'm not sure if this was covered. One of my coworkers told me that she was told that if a patient stayed greater than 24 hours in a readmission, that is not a readmission. Is that true? Less, 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 sorry. Sorry. That's <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, here's the answer. So that is the last of the slides. Okay. We have Dr. Bo Bowman. I'm sorry, I have a migraine. Uh, here. Uh, 
Uh, this is kind of informal, so if you want to just pose any questions to him, um, he'll be happy to answer it. Or if you want him to do a presentation, he does have a handy dandy thumb drive that we can load. But I take it from knowing you, the group for some time, two weeks now, I think you probably like the informal approach. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Bowman. Yeah, I know, it's like death by PowerPoint, right? It's like the worst thing, the plague of America. Uh, just I'll tell you quickly about myself. Um, so I'm the medical director of the University of Virginia's dialysis program. Uh, that's our outpatient dialysis program. So we've got 11 dialysis units throughout central Virginia. We go from Page, Virginia to Appomattox to Zion's Crossroads around here. So we've had a, a pretty interesting one. That's not usual in health systems to own dialysis programs. They typically work with one of the big guys. That's Fresenius or DeVita. So we have a lot of experience in outpatient, but relevant to you, I spend most of my time when I'm not doing that hanging out in the ICU. And so that's where I spend most of my consultation time. I am technically on call uh, for that, so I'm keeping my pager and my partner said she'd cover for about 20 minutes so I could run over here. But she knows it's a pain, so that's the case. And I go where Judy Smith tells me to go, so if this goes off the rails, it's her fault. Um, but, you know, I didn't prepare anything, but, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, those of you that you know me know I can fill plenty of air time, so that's fine. So, but any questions you have, so Judy mentioned a couple of things that sound like they were confusing, so I'm happy to just kind of touch on those things. But if you guys have questions, just feel free to fire away. I mean, the renal is like a weird voodoo black box thing, so like no one knows what we're talking about most of the time, and that's good. That gives us job security, so we're happy with that. So there's no questions that seem silly, like what is dialysis? That is a fine question, by the way to ask. I just spent about 30 minutes trying to explain it to a medical student. Then he looked at me like I was an idiot when I was done. So, so that happens. So if you're confused by that versus things like ultrafiltration versus CRRT, remember we're using words to confuse you so that you won't take our jobs. That's what we're looking for. So if we keep you confused, it's actually very simple. Um, and so we can talk about that. So I'm happy to take a couple questions if you're ready. When do you use code ultrafiltration versus dialysis? There's a few <clears throat> different ones. In the chart, if we're looking at your chart, yeah. to see what is actually being done, because you know, if you're just doing ultrafiltration, you don't get coded as a renal failure, which is not good, obviously for our, you know, for our numbers and things. Right. But if it, you know, it seems that ultrafiltration, CRTT or CRRT, and all these things are. You know, one person says it's this, the, same, the, the dialysis nurse says it's this, the surgeon said it was this, and then you have no idea what they Only we did. tell the truth. If you use that as your guiding, <laughs> but you will well, be right. <laughs> yeah, so, so terms. Uh, so we have a whole like, kind of presentation that's a nephrology alphabet soup. Um, so, and CRT gets tricky. I learned actually, so in deference to my surgical colleagues, I learned CRT from the, at the shock trauma ICU up at University of Maryland where the surgeons run CRT. And boy, does that chap the kidney doctor, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, but, so hemodialysis. Hemodialysis, can take it back to high school chemistry for a moment. So you remember diffusion. An easy way to remember diffusion is just think of a bucket of water, you drop the food dye in it, right? So you do this with the kids, and you come back a few hours later, and miraculously, through random molecular movement, without you stirring, everything's dissolved and distributed equally. So basically, things move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. That's dialysis. That is diffusion. What we're doing is we're running a sterile, medical-grade water, basically IV fluid, against a column of blood and we have a membrane between those two, and that allows a lot of things that are in the blood at high concentration that we don't want, potassium, BUN, to flow down that membrane. And because the dialysate is always moving, it never comes into equilibrium. In other words, we never saturate it so it never stops. So that's dialysis, okay? That is totally different than ultrafiltration. But we sometimes do them at the same time, and sometimes we do one, and sometimes we don't do the other. So the verbiage here gets confusing. Ultrafiltration, we don't need any dialysis. Ultrafiltration is basically when we apply a negative pressure against a column of blood. And what we're doing is we're basically taking out the plasma water. Okay, so we're essentially dehydrating the blood. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's a big difference. Some patients need just fluid off. This was big. 
and looking around the room, many of you have hair my color, so I know you've been doing this a while too. So remember in heart failure, ultrafiltration, isolate, aquaphoresis they called it. That's another term just to, yeah, aquaphoresis. It's good, it's good for marketing, right? It sells a lot of machines. It's just, it's, ultra, it's ultrafiltration. That's all aquaphoresis is. It's done really slowly and inefficiently. So you'll see slow, continuous ultrafiltration. It's really slow ultrafiltration. It takes me three hours to do it on a dialysis machine. They can use something similar to a CRRT machine. And they'll call it scuff when they want to get fancy. We're going to do some scuff today. Just, ah. Right? So it gets frustrating. It's very difficult. But ultrafiltration, when you see UF, is ultrafiltration. Now, can you do dialysis? at the same time you do ultrafiltration. Absolutely. Do we often clean blood and remove excess water at the same time? Absolutely. So a patient may undergo a dialysis session and in the note, oftentimes we want to know how much ultrafiltration was completed during that session. And so we ask our nurses, report to me your cleaning metrics. You'll see this noted in the chart as the KT over V. Has anybody seen that before? Guys, I don't stay away from that, right? That's math. We don't like it. So the KT over V tells us how good did we do cleaning, and the ultrafiltration volume is how well, how much fluid we removed net, if we're writing it down correctly. Okay. Now CRRT always implies dialysis. CRRT is basically really, really, really slow dialysis. So you don't have to worry too much about that one. There's a couple of ways to clean blood. One uses the way we talked about that CVVHD, which is just really slow dialysis. Okay, there's another way to do that too, it's called hemofiltration, but it gets you to the same point. For your purposes, that's renal failure, and that counts. That's blood cleaning, and blood cleaning counts against us. So we want to know about that one. But isolated ultrafiltration with a CRRT machine isn't practiced that often. Heart failure docs do it, and sometimes people do it, and they'll call that scuff or aquaphoresis. Those are the same terms, but they're just talking about really slow, wimpy ultrafiltration. There is no cleaning being done. That does not count as treating or managing renal failure. It doesn't. Now, I don't know how the Society for Thoracic Surgery or the quality people count that, but it shouldn't. It is it's fundamentally not, you know, they often ride together, but they are certainly not the same things. Plenty of people are having fluid removed and have completely normal kidney function. That's not that common, but that's how it should be done, in my humble opinion. Not that anyone's going to listen to me. No one has before, why start now? So if we're, I think what we're seeing frequently, and I think you answered this, but I want to make sure I understand. So if we see documented CRRT for volume overload or CRRT for ultrafiltration, yeah. we're going to assume that's also cleaning the blood, and so we have to count that? Yeah, so if, someone, if someone's using a CRRT machine, they're cleaning the blood. Now, they, now here's where it gets fancy. Some machine people wanted to sell some machines and they wanted a machine that just does ultrafiltration. And they sold these as these aquaphoresis machines. And these were, these were big about three, four years ago, I think. But a CRRT machine, in order to run, it basically has to do um, CRRT, typically. Now, it does depend on your person between, you know, Baxter, next stage, and the machines, and those kind of things. So a next stage machine can really only run and clean blood at the same time. Now, here's where this gets weird. Somebody may not want any blood cleaning. They may say, gosh, the, the BUN and creatinine look fine. We don't need any cleaning, but I'm going to use the CRRT machine because I need volume. We do that. Somebody comes out of the OR, they're getting a tremendous amount of IV fluid, five, six, seven liters in 24 hours. Surgeon says to me, I need this guy's volume managed. He's, he can't pee out seven liters in 24 hours. I need your CRRT machine. That patient may not have renal failure, but they used a CRRT machine to manage the volume. So it's kind of like the lawyers say, there's what they did and there's intent. Did you they did clean the blood. Did you code that as so would you call renal that failure? I code it, yes, yeah, so you'd code a dialysis code, but I'll code that against the diagnosis code of volume overload. That's what I code, I code we volume code overload. That as if you just saw a procedure, I don't know what you have to do, that's a problem. So how would, how would you guys I was just going to, I wanted to know how you would call it. <laughs> yeah, I code it as volume overload. It's just the tool I have to treat the diagnosis. So if I was looking at what the ICD-10 code is, this is volume overload and OS. Or whatever. So that's where the gray area is for us because... So if their BUN and creatinine are normal or near normal, mm -hmm. and they get a, a procedure, something done, Yeah. The CRRT, we, you're thinking that's just ultrafiltration. Yeah, if they're using it for those purposes. And in my note, we're going to try and suggest this is why we're doing it. Because 
I'll tell you, the billing and coding police that come behind me are going to say, Dr. Bowman, you certainly cannot code renal failure when there is no renal failure. And so we, you know, we, if we submitted those through to CMS, I think you know, the, the audit would not pass. So volume overload is a very good reason to use the tools you have. And this is growing up out of practicality, right? Most systems don't want to own multiple machines. I'm going to buy one CRT machine. It could do, if you get some cleaning as a side dish to your main entree, that's fine. Right? You're not going to hurt somebody by cleaning their blood. So as, as a practical point, they've grown up to use it that way. Well, and you know, we, we've all bitterly complained to the STS that it, their definition is, it is what it is. We don't like it. Yeah, yeah, so no, I know. And that puts you, so that puts you in a jam. Are, are we all coding it as? We wonder, when you look at the slides, we wonder if everybody yeah, we're, is. Yeah, we're really, we're we're really questioning that because if you look at the slide, I'm the person that he's going to talk about on the next slide, but if you look at that renal failure slide for 16, 17, and 18, there's 18 programs on that slide. And if you look at that slide, 11 of those programs are struggling this year. And I, oh, I'm we're saying 18 over what they did in 16 and 17. And seven programs are not. And some of those programs were pretty high in 16 and 17 and now have zero in 18. Zero. How is that? You know, it, I don't it, think I've coded ultrafiltration twice in five years, 10 yeah. years. I, mean, I never have because I, I know we don't do, we don't do it. it either. But it, you know, in, in it, I it see really the is everywhere. disheartening. So it always makes me worry that I am overcoding. Yeah, and it's disheartening because you know our main focus as a, as a coalition is to be sure that we all look at things the same way. But when you look at the slides, you have to wonder. So the danger of volume overload, I'll come right back to you. The danger of volume overload came out in the, in the literature uh, really probably about five, six years ago. So we talk about, you guys have heard the term, cardiorenal syndrome and these kind of things. So, you know, everybody came in, they got 12 liters of resuscitation for sepsis, and then they got their ongoing pressors of three to five liters of obligates per day. Next thing you know, the person's gained 50, 60 pounds, and there's edema everywhere. And so the movement in the ICUs, not just in the CT surgery ICUs, but in the MICU and the SICU, have all been to um, start volume removal early. Not necessarily because the person has a classical indication for renal failure, and I think that's why you're seeing a lot more proactive volume removal, because they're trying to reduce ventilator days, right? That's the big outcome that they're thinking about, but there's gut GI kind of improvements down there, hepatic congestion, all these other things improve, we think, uh, with, with, with good volume management that's proactive, because you know these people are going to get three liters every day. And so this has led to a tremendous amount of confusion because when people decided to do this, they decided to do this using the tools that we currently have, which unfortunately happen to be dialysis machines. Okay, sorry, your question. That's all right. You had said CRRT always implies dialysis. Yeah. And is it possible that nephrologists or intensivists might be saying patient had CRRT, even though it was really, it's an umbrella maybe verbiage that they're using, CRT for ultrafiltration, if they had had that in there, if they spoke specific to ultrafiltration, that's the only reason we use this machine because it's a multi-purpose machine. Am I able to code that as ultrafiltration or do I still have to code it as dialysis? Because I'm told we have to still code it as dialysis with normal yeah, so those are the quality reporting rules, and there's a what do I report from a billing and coding standpoint, right? And so the Renal Physicians Association, the RPA, would say you code that as a dialysis other procedure performed for the ICD-10 code of volume overload, not transfusion related. And that's how we would code that. Uh, and that's what it goes down to in our CMS billing and coding. What you guys have to do, I don't know the rules that you have to do that, but you are using that machine. Every time we ask, right, if we're using that machine, no matter the intent, we clean the blood, so it's dialysis. This is, I shot him in self-defense, right? This is, I didn't murder him, I shot him in self-defense. I don't agree. I don't think any of us agree with that. Yeah, so, so I'll give you a for instance from our world. So in dialysis, um, we're, we're just like everyone else, we're charged for bloodstream infections related to catheters, and of course you've seen plenty of dialysis catheters in your life. And so it's CMS decided because they couldn't figure out who got a bloodstream infection related to their catheter versus who got sepsis from a foot room from diabetic uh, foot ulcer. So we get charged for every bloodstream infection. And my guess is that from an administrative standpoint, they said, yeah, we don't like you guys interpreting intent. 
You know, we don't, eh, they use this here. The cranny was 1.5. Eh, you know, it's a little on the edge down there. And they said, you know what, this is too hard. And they did the same thing in your world that, that CMS did to us. They said, too many of you guys are gaming the system and saying, oh, that bloodstream infection, oh, that, that, that was a contaminant, that was a contaminant. Yeah, you know, the guy's on three pressers. Definitely a contaminant, definitely a contaminant, right? So dialysis programs were playing that game to game their quality numbers. And so, you know, I think what they've done, I would imagine this thinking in their room is the same as it is in a CMS's room for us, is that they've said, this is too hard for us to adjudicate. And so we're just going to take all procedures and count it the same. Um, I think it's more cut and dry for you guys than it is for CLABSIs for us. And I think you have a good case. But, you know, I think that has to be documented appropriately. Um, and, and your nephrologist and nephrology nurse, hopefully, are, are documenting that. But it, it's often not done. It all depends on your EMR and, and culture and those things. There's no standardization in our industry to help you, unfortunately. We, we've asked our teams to do that at UVA so that we know what happened last night when we walk in the door. And so we can understand, because often that nurse, of course, is not there. The night nurse should go home, all right? Yes. Um, so we want to understand what happened. And so we've gotten much more clear in our in our documentation, but that's new. I mean, that's not, that's not, that's not happening. So I'm sympathetic, I understand. I don't think we'll win, <laughs> but but I agree with you. So I think that's a big one. Other, other questions, concerns? Um, I see your second bullet. Are we going to move on? We can. I don't know whose slides these are, but I'll talk to anybody's Actually, slides. The reason, <laughs> the reason I ask is the, the second bullet point is CRT terminology, and I know on that? our last oh, yeah. conference call, yep. there was a lot of discussion about whether or not people were just documenting it properly and just calling it CRT, and it really wasn't. And right. I, I know that's not the case in our organization, but... So here's the big ones. Right, so CRT is a blanket term for slow dialysis. This tends to be very inefficient. You can do this through two methods now. One is CVVHF, that is a subtype of CRT. It's continuous venovenous hemofiltration. We should get rid of, it's not like ECMO where you have A, V, V. We don't have that, we're all V now, or just V. We should get rid of it, there is no A. So there's hemofiltration and there's slow hemodialysis or CVVHD. Those are two subtypes of CRT. Those are the same. Some machines do one, some, all, all machines do both. Some machines can do both at the same time. Okay, so you may see that together. And that's the new rage in dialysis, by the way, to do both because some places think it's an added benefit. So that's CRRT. There's other options too. So when I'm at the private practice hospital and covering them, we don't have CRRT machines. We have hemodialysis machines, traditionally large box machines, size of this podium. And we can run those similar to a CRRT machine. This is called SLED, slow, low efficiency dialysis. And if you ever rotate at University of Alabama, Birmingham, this is what they're famous for. So they do SLED. If you don't want to invest in CRRT machines, and guess what? The outcomes are the same. If you go to the ICU, a major tertiary care ICU, if someone tells you you're going to take away my CRT machines, you'd think that that would be terrible. But in fact, there's never been a difference shown in any head-to-head -head study between using a CRT machine versus a hemodialysis machine. But if you thought you were taking away some in CRT machine, the intensivist would say, out of my cold, dead hands, you will. <laughs> but in fact, there's no data to support one or the other, which would, I like, I like CRT, but I'll just tell you that's what the facts are. The last one is that scuff, that slow, continuous ultrafiltration. So a lot of times, um, non-nephrologists will use some of these terms interchangeably. And I think you kind of have to go to the nephrology nursing note and the nephrologist note as your last gasp resort. Intensivists have tremendous variation in their comfort zone with this stuff. So they may use funny terms. And they may accidentally say CRT when they meet SLED or vice versa. Other stuff. And you're like, this is ridiculous, I know. It is ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know if Judy wanted me to talk about this, but I'm, I'm happy to, to mention that if anyone's using that kind of stuff. I don't know if that one's for me, though. I think that one was. Yeah, is anyone else using NephroCheck? Anybody had this before? Heard this? Yeah. Are you guys using it? Kind of. <laughs> We're piloting it. Are you seeing any benefit that they have? Yeah, I think, um, so as, as just a general 
So there's two parts to this. There's detection and there's taking the action based on that detection. And I think right now we're kind of running in a blind trial, which is to say, does it correlate with the kidney failure we see later? So remember, we're constantly generating creatinine at a slow rate, so we turn positive late in the game. Plus, you're getting a lot of fluid. So we're typically talking 18 to 24 hours for a positive creatinine to come back, right? Depends on the pace of your labs, how bad the kidney injury is, but it takes a while. So if, if you get a positive check at four hours, which is pretty good, I think our four-hour checks are pretty legit. I think at 16 hours, we're seeing a lot of positives, like the entire unit has renal failure. <laughs> it's not that bad, but it's pretty positive. I think the four-hour checks have been helpful. The next phase then is to now map those back to the creatinines and say, were these clinically significant events? Everyone's getting micro damage, right, of the kidneys in this situation. So that's happening. And if the threshold of the test is too low, then it picks up that micro damage that, you know, it doesn't necessarily, something that we need to worry about. So what we need to know is, is this, is this triggering um, clinically important kidney failure. Uh, so just like everyone gets kind of, you know, there's some element of cerebral malperfusion or microemboli going to the brain, there's damage happening to the kidney too. So we don't know the answer to that yet, because uh, I haven't looked at the data and seen and mapped that over the creatinines. So interestingly, I, I spoke with the guy from Nefrocheck a handful of times, mm -hmm. and one of the things that he had said, which was kind of counter to what we had talked hear about, and I believe one of your contemporaries had talked about at, what's the other place that we meet at in Charlottesville, on the other side of the 250. Um, I don't get invited to these meetings, I can't tell you. Well, he had, he had come to a, a couple meetings, and, and the winter meetings, mm -hmm. and he had talked about the relationship of post-op, post-CV surgery, um, mm -hmm. renal insufficiency, and timing of cath, mm -hmm. and the diet. Yeah, probably Charles. So Nefrachek is saying there's, and he said this, I believe, at the last meeting that he presented, that there was no relationship between the time of cath and timing of cardiac surgery. Yeah. Which, I mean, I... I don't know the context of what the Nefrachek folks, you know, meant it as. Um, I, I mean, I kind of find it a little... It seems like they should run together to me, I guess I would say. And for us, you know, the nephro check isn't cheap. There isn't any evidence out there yet in cardiac surgery that I'm aware of that's, you know, most of it's all preliminary. And I think for cardiac surgery, we've been hanging our hats on the idea that if somebody gets cat and she's 90 years old and her baseline creatinine is one and a 50 kilo lady, we'd probably be better off waiting, you know, a day or two before we do her. Um, I don't know. Does, I know that that's what Dr. Spear had told me that you guys were doing at Inova Fairfax. Yeah, three three to five days in some cases. So I would argue that uh, the data that I've seen is probably not strong enough to say hold off on that on the cath. If you can hold successfully on hold off on the yeah. cabbage, because I think you can prophylax patients pretty successfully during the cath. If you know what you're doing and you can do a cath in a safer way, there's, there's plenty of evidence-based ways to reduce the risk of a cardiac cath. I think what we see is that people come in, they're NPO for their cath, they get a bad cath, they're already dehydrated, and then immediately go to an ischemic situation in the surgery. Those two are not good. I think if you prophylax a patient properly with isotonic crystalloid, right, given at a, at a rate, and you're moving contrast dye, you can get those rates very low for contrast-induced uh, nephropathy. I think if you have that kind of a protocol in place, I, I think I would be, I would be loath to tell a surgeon to wait, especially in a critical case. Um, but you're going to find the creatinine rise roughly 48 hours. If it hasn't happened by day three, you know, you really should be in the clear uh, for these patients. If it was going to happen, it should have happened then. So, uh, you know, I think you're not going to see delayed contrast injury like at seven days. Um, I think two to three days is, is reasonable. If you're at the three-day mark and there's no, no sign of any worsening uh, renal function, that I would proceed and I wouldn't wait any further. Is there any other part of that renal protection measure from a cardiology standpoint other than aggressive isotonic, you know, um, volume to resuscitation? Date. No, the very most, and remember, so you got two issues. One, you've got volume depletion. So that's a risk. So we don't know how much of these people going into a cath were already volume depleted. 
and then they get beat up by the surgery, and then it happens It happens right after the surgery. That's too soon for a creatinine to rise. That had to be from an event beforehand. But, you know, we, f we, we end up with a lot of NPO people, uh, right, who are already volume depleted, but guess what? They want to be good patients. I took my Lasix today, Doc. I'm NPO, but I took my Lasix. What water were you taking out? You know, you didn't have any. And then they go immediately to that episode. And then we see the creatinine rise, and we say, oh, this must be contrast. There's no test for contrast, by the way. It's just the nephrologist eyeballing the lab. Oh, this seems like contrast. Like, That's the gold standard? Really? That's not a great gold standard. So, so there's not. But I think if you manage the volume issue, the, the issue I wanted to get to is that just giving them the fluids doesn't count. You've got to get the fluids in and get the fluids out. So this is the one situation where I want to give this person fluids, and I want to really flush out the contrast. That's really what I'm shooting for in this situation. So if I've got somebody that's volume replete, let's say that I've got you, you hold your Lasix, you're taking fluids, you come in for your cath, and we're going to give you crystalloid because you're, you have chronic kidney disease stage 3 uh, or stage 4 in your high-risk cath. If I can bring the fluids in and run them out with Lasix, so the most successful device trial was something called Renal Guard, which is where they gave them a Foley, basically. They detected the volume, and when the patient needed an automated squirt of Lasix, the machine delivered Lasix. The fluids went in, and to our heart failure colleague's joy, the fluids went out. If you can do that, almost none of those patients got kidney failure from contrast. So I think if, if a system like that exists, you can, you, can, you can do this. You can do the kind of manual version of this where you look at the bag and count the fluid and order a PRN dose of Lasix. I think if you do those kinds of things, you can really reduce people's risk of contrast, and you can think about going to a cath sooner, especially in a patient that is unstable and needs to get into the OR and get that get that, get that uh, treated. So I think that's reasonable. Um, where I think going back to nephrocheck is, would be helpful is if we have appropriate detection and it maps to true renal failure, and then we do something about it. So right now we're just staring at it. We're doing the same stuff. So if we just look at it and say it's got a positive nephrocheck, then it is, you know, it's great. We prove that it, it works. Uh, but we're not doing anything with it. So that's kind of phase two. So once we feel like it works together. So the um, uh, ASN and uh, um, Kadoki, which is our kind of kidney disease quality initiative, have got, got what's called the Kadoki bundle. I think that's been talked about before, but this is kind of this basket of interventions, which are basically just supportive care. So there's nothing innovative about that. That's just supportive stuff. You know, don't give them Toradol immediately, right? But as you guys know, we're bad at the fundamentals. You, you know, you know, it, it might happen, but just because we say, well, that's an obvious intervention, that doesn't mean that it gets protocolized and done properly. So, you know, Kedoki is just saying, just do the stuff that you know is right. I mean, that's, that's a hard lift, actually, to get that stuff done properly. Uh, but I think when we analyze our numbers, the 24-hour check is going to be, or the 4-hour check is going to be good. I worry that for us so far, the 16-hour check has been, has been a little high, but I'll, I'll, we'll know that better soon. Meaning the 4-hour check is predictive. Yeah, I think it maps pretty good so far, um, but I haven't looked back more than our first few cases to see if that's still true. But I knew that the rate seemed awfully high on the early numbers for nephrotech, which just could mean that the threshold needs to move for that test for the 16-hour. It doesn't mean that the test is bad. It just means that the threshold for the 16-hour test might be too low for us, I think. Because a lot of those cases I don't think turn into, you know, clinically significant renal injury, if that makes sense. And that's not a, fu that's not a flaw with the science. That's a flaw with the threshold. And that's, that's an easy test. Just go back and look at the numbers and say, okay, this is, we need to move the threshold here for a positive test. That makes sense. Okay, I don't know how much time I have, so I'm just blathering on. So if you guys need to get out of here, that's also fine. I'm ignoring my fellow and making him work right now. He's paging me. You didn't have any more slides, or is that it? I didn't have any slides, thank okay. God. This is like the best presentation of the day. There's not a single slide for you guys. Well, actually, it's, it's been very helpful. Thank you. And I'm talking to you. Well, just so I say, like, I don't think we solved your problem. So I think you're right. And just like when my kids, you know, say, well, we don't like this down. I said, yeah, no, you're totally right, but I'm not going to change my mind, though. Stick it. You know, so there's a little bit of that, right? So the situation is a tough one. But I think you're fundamentally right. And I think the difficulty is probably proving to the organization that you can really adjudicate these cases of isolated ultrafiltration versus renal failure. Because the science moved, right? So it moved on you. And, and the guidelines for reporting didn't change. People became very worried about volume overload and are aggressive in managing that. And the guidelines or reporting rules probably didn't move with uh, the science, uh, if you will. And that, that probably needs to, be, needs to be disconnected because I, I, I can imagine that can really hurt a program uh, who's doing the right things by the science and is getting beat up on the quality markers unintentionally, even though that's what I would want done as a patient. So I think well, that's in, unfortunate. In my opinion, 
or what it's worth. They should change the definition to say, uh, you know, just a new requirement for dialysis should not, it, it needs to be in conjunction with the numbers. And, and my point is, you know, they do this to us in lung disease. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll have, they say, they said, you know, you can use a PFT, but it has to be read by a pulmonologist. Well, when the pulmonologist read it, he said the patient had moderate obstructive lung disease. But by their number parameters, he only had mild. Yeah. So they're saying, you got to have a pulmonologist, but don't pay attention to what he said. <laughs> go by the numbers. And go by the numbers. Have you met and pulmonologists? I, I don't listen to those people either. The definition <laughs> needs Nuts. to be changed to reflect the fact that if, the, if they don't meet the numbers, even if they're on CRRT, that doesn't count. Now, if they are on CRT and they meet the numbers, they're fine. But yeah, th that's what I think. And I what's think happened is, it, well, it's you guys know because you, <laughs> you stage by Aiken and Rifle too, which were, by the way, research criteria. They were never meant to be applied clinically. They were not. This was so that you know we could do research on people and put them in trials and have some grading scale like they do in cancer and those kind of things. Uh, but you know, you'd have to say, you know, you wouldn't dialyze. So by definition, somebody in stage one acute renal failure or acute kidney injury is not supposed to be getting dialysis. So if they're on dialysis and they have stage one acute kidney injury, then you know you're doing a procedure that's not indicated. So you know there are ways I think that they can adjudicate these effectively, and and pull out the ultrafiltration isolated episodes from the renal failure. Uh, but it's, it's going to take some doing, I would imagine, and it's probably tough. And they did what we often do is kick that down the road to the next working group. Right. So are we consensus then? I, I was just going to say, maybe we need to discuss how we're, we yeah. are going to do this. Yeah. Um, what if we went by Cody? I don't see the Cody. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I don't see the Cody. I, I think. Aquaphoresis machine, which I would suggest you should yeah. return. But, that's but, if but like he said, if you're using the CRRT machine, you are washing the blood. But if they don't say it, I don't know it. But but oh. in but if they say if <coughs> in in yeah. the FAQs under the yeah. renal failure if thing, it says CRRT. It's so I'm like just want a question. Well, hey, join the club. I'm with you. So so the. So with with scuff or with uh, with dialysis, where you're doing isolated ultrafiltration, you know it's hard to get blood to run through at a slow rate and just isolated dehydrated, right? So you're running blood flow rates. I know you guys hang out with ECMO, so you're like two three liters. So you're like the, the cool kids, and we've just got our wimpy 200 cc's per minute over here. But 
um, we can keep the circuit open. When you start to get to low flows of 100 cc's or CRT type flows, and you try and take water out of that, it makes sense. You're concentrating the blood up and it just clots on you. So it's really tough to do isolated ultrafiltration on CRT. I'm not aware, certainly our machines won't do that. Um, Baxter's got a new machine coming out. I think there's another version of the Prisma that's coming out and, and maybe, maybe somebody's ginned up a way to do that, but I'm not aware of it yet. So, and I do apologize. I have to go. He's going to keep paging me. He's relentless. <laughs> he wants help. No, I'm kidding. He's great. I appreciate you coming. No, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. So, if there's ever another time that, uh, that we can uh, uh, be of help, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, and I can be better prepared or prepare something if that's, if that's helpful to you all. But uh, thanks very much for the invitation. I appreciate it. Thank you.